I'm sure many of you have already seen some of my amazing colleagues' talks. Um, everybody's been sort of crushing it this year at GDC, and it's super exciting. Uh, but it was a little bit more pressure on me. So it says out there that the talk is reinventing God of War, but I realized as I was writing it that I was covering a lot of stuff that, that really smart people and really good people were already going to cover in their talks in a much better way than I was. So I was trying to figure out what would be a really good talk that would be much more specific of the things that I do on a daily basis. So I'm doing something about pitching and doubting, which is pretty much what I do the entirety of a project. I talk to people and beg and sell uh, and then you know, try to either quell doubt from other people while the whole time experiencing a tremendous amount of doubt myself. It is fantastic. It is exciting. It's not a very glamorous job. Everybody thinks it's glamorous, but really it's just constantly stressful. So in April of 2013, uh, I started talking to Shanna Studstill um, and I initially had a pitch for the game. And it was a little bit like this. I, I don't even know if this is the exact thing I said, but this is essentially what it was, right? I want to do something really huge and bold. And the arm gestures are extremely important when you are talking about shit you have no idea about. So when I was telling people about stuff, I'm moving my arms around, it's gonna be huge and bold, and you raise your voice every once in a while, and you know we're gonna turn everything upside down and just freak people out. There was nothing of substance to that initial pitch, but she was still interested in actually continuing to work together because she figured eventually you're gonna figure it out and you're gonna get it. So I came back to the studio in June uh, of 2013, right? It was like the first 15 days of June that I came back and started working with a bunch of people and trying to formulate what it is I wanted to do with this game that wasn't just huge and bold and lots of arm gestures. Uh, and after four weeks, uh, I put together a pitch and I was going to be pitching Scott Rohde. So the way the organization works is Shannon Studstill, who I had mentioned earlier, she's heading up Santa Monica. She's sort of the first gate that I went through, right? And then Scott Rohde is sort of overseeing all the other, the, the, the studios within North America. So he's kind of the, the next gate, the person I have to pitch on that list. And then you have Shuhei Yoshida, who is kind of like the scary gate that I have to pitch. Uh, and, and then after that, it gets up to Sean. And by that time, I, I pretty much probably have it figured out. So it's a little bit less scary. But something I realized when I was putting this presentation together is that everybody above me has a fucking S in their name. <laughs> they all work for Sony. Their names begin with S and I realized like, you know, Progress upwards in this company is all related to the whether or not you have an S in your name. <laughs> so today I'm going to change my name. <laughs> and uh, I added a few S's at the end. That way there's nobody that's gonna overtake me. Uh, and I will be the vice president of vice presidenting. So if you have any questions about vice presidenting, I am the person you're going to come to. I'll probably outsource it to somebody else so that I can probably finish Red Dead uh, most of the time. That's not a real email, so don't try to contact it. It won't get you <laughs> anywhere. So moving on to a really smooth segue like I just did. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is something that nobody outside of the company has seen. It is the very first pitch that I did uh, for Scott Rohde that kind of kicked this entire thing off. And I ended up doing variations of this pitch throughout the duration of the game. So I'm gonna break a little bit in the middle and then switch to one that was from a little bit later. And then I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit more specifically about doubt, about the doubt that I was feeling throughout all of this and kind of encapsulated in a very long winded story that I'm gonna tell. So this is gonna have director's commentary. So I'm not really gonna do the pitch officially, mostly because it was like five years ago and I'm old and I really can't remember every single thing, but I can kind of poke fun at all the stupidity that I had at that moment. And you can all see how something like this game started out really bad, really bad. So starting off right away, we're using the old logo because it was four weeks and I even put that at the bottom of the presentation. That was to prepare Scott that I'd only had four weeks to work on this. So please lower your expectations. 
So it's August 14th, 2013. And this next image was not actually in the original presentation. I would just do a verbal description of this, but I added it in. So there's a couple images I had to switch out uh, to make this thing work. But what I would talk about was the idea that all the mythologies of the world are kind of like this Hubble telescope image. They are like galaxies individually spread out throughout a, a complete universe. And the world is the universe. And all the mythologies are sort of origin stories of various cultures throughout the world, beginning at the beginning of time and stretching all the way out. So at, at any given time, all the mythologies exist together concurrently, and they are simply separated by geography. So it was important because some people had the conception that, hey, Kratos at the end of God of War III destroyed the world. Well, he destroyed the, what they believed the world was in Greece, which was their world. Everybody believed their world was the only world. In fact, we still believe that today. So initially, we were talking about this concept. I didn't have a really good word for it. So I was calling it a reboot, but I knew that I didn't want to continue to call it a reboot because keep calling it a reboot, a lot of people would have these misconceptions and all this baggage that comes along with what a reboot is. So I wanted to explain what a reboot was by using one of my favorite things in the entire world, Star Trek. Right? So the Star Trek fans, that's fantastic. Uh, so I would talk about this concept of Star Trek Nemesis Right, had that classic sort of familiar, high-end TV-focused appeal. It didn't really broaden the audience. It was sort of appealing to people who were already Star Trek fans. And then the new reboot, the J.J. Abrams one in 2009, kind of brought in that sort of new feel, the cutting edge. And, and honestly, the thing that was most important, the thing I put in orange, was this idea that theirs was an origin story. So they were telling the story of uh, Spock and um, Kirk, and kind of going back to the days of the Academy. And you can see I, at the beginning, was calling it God of War 4 uh, because I didn't have any idea what we were going to call it. I thought I was going to put a subtitle at the end of it. So I was like, whatever, we'll just call it God of War 4 because I didn't want to confuse anybody if I called it just God of War. And then I ended up just calling it God of War. <laughs> it's fantastic. So what does this mean, right? Uh, it means that directors are the worst artists on the planet and I just grab an image off of internet, the internet, and I actually have a, it means a reset, right? It means we're going to reset everything, but in a different way, right? We're not gonna go back and say, well, what we're gonna do is tell Kratos' new origin story. No, we're gonna actually continue the timeline and reinvent the feel. And the important part of this was to say that we did so much work developing the character of Kratos, why would we throw all that out and start on a new character? Because you just have to build all that backstory again. So we're sort of treating the first seven games like the chapter one of this character's life. But he still needed as a character to grow. We wanted to grow the character, we wanted to grow the world. Everything needed to expand out and give you a sense that something was going to be different. And, you know, wanted to, in the initial pitch, because I didn't have a lot, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the studio as well. So talking about how the studio was going to play to our strengths. Because we were really good at making action adventure games. We wanted to make sure that we stayed on that track of making action adventure games. But we wanted to broaden our skills, right? Open things up and feel like we were progressing forward. Because for a long time, we kind of got stuck in this rut of doing, hey, we, we, we did the last game. Let's pile some more stuff on top of that. So we wouldn't really go in and just kind of rip things up. and then. When you are asking executives for money, usually you do things like the next two points. And I'm a little embarrassed about them, but I'm going to show them anyway. Uh, you say things like, own the action adventure genre. <laughs> Uh, and I, at the time, was just like, I was like cringeworthy when I was saying it. I was like, you know, it's that aspirational goal of, man, we're going we're gonna to do something great. And I think for me and I think for the rest of the team, the concept was that we were going to own the work that we had done, that we were going to really, truly stand behind everything that we had done and really try to excel at all of that. Uh, and then this one, this truly is the one that you say when you want people to give you money. Great game of the year. <laughs> Now this was four weeks in, and we said we were going to do that. And even I thought that was total bullshit. Uh, but I was like, all right, you know, this is, we're going to do this. And it was that, that level of enthusiasm, even though inside, I'm going like, yeah, right. You know, this is not, not going to happen. Uh, but it will get people really excited. 
So moving on to the, the narrative, continuing the timeline, growing the character, continue to sort of hammer that same point home that we're not restarting anything. It is the same Kratos that you know, except we're going to figure out how we're going to change it. And while I was sort of on my travels after having left uh, right before three uh, fully started, something I had learned from a bunch of different directors was this adage of simple story, complex characters. And full disclosure, I did not listen to this first rule. So the first year, there are several points in here that I ignored that I was telling other people, we need to do this, and then I totally screwed up. So I ended up having to reboot the reboot of the script. So we wrote a script for a year, and it was the wrong script, right? I was sort of realizing that, OK, I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't making this about uh, the main characters. And the story sort of meandered a little bit. And Kratos, seeking a fresh start. So this picture right here is sort of what people thought of Kratos before we sort of released the, the demo in 2016, right? It was like angry Kratos, the guy who killed somebody at the beginning of a cinematic and just kind of stood there until the cinematic ended. Uh, he was just an angry, violent, scary guy. And uh, you know, not only did he need a fresh start, but I think the player needed a fresh start as well. They needed a new perspective on this character. And in a way, you know, I'm getting older, the studio has been around for a lot longer, so I was looking around at all the people that I've been developing games with for like 10 years, and, and we were all old. Uh, and the interesting thing was this concept of breaking the cycle, right? And it was so multi-layered because it was breaking the cycle for us as a studio, kind of getting caught in that rut of saying, well, you know, we did the last game, let's just keep putting things on top of it instead of really digging in and saying, we're just gonna rip this thing up and figure something new out. It was me as a developer sort of having some sort of confidence in, in what I was doing and trying different things having a little bit more confidence to try those things, even though I would experience doubt all the way through all of this. But it's also Kratos kind of breaking this cycle, this cycle that he had since the beginning of the gods sort of screwing with his life, uh, him being an absolutely crap father, uh, him sort of blaming the rest of the world, right? That was one of the big aspects of Kratos' character was it's everybody else's fault. This isn't my fault, it's other people's fault. That's why I'm such a jerk. Uh, and the key to breaking that cycle was gonna be this father-son story. Here's another point in which I completely lost the plot for the first year of the game and ended up writing a story that assumed you already knew the relationship of the father-son uh, and we sort of had to go and reboot that. Now this was an important aspect. This was really trying to cement the concept that this isn't a new Kratos. This is the same Kratos who's just a lot older. So that means he still has this monster inside of him. Uh, I was using the example of the Hulk a lot. So I would basically say that in the previous games, the Hulk was out all the time. It was all 100% the Hulk, kill, 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 smash, right? No Bruce Banner whatsoever. And in this one, I really wanted to experiment with the idea that he was primarily Bruce Banner and he was struggling to actually keep the Hulk inside. So this monster that he was keeping inside, this monster the, the, of the Kratos that everybody knew was gonna be something that he struggled and failed because failure is such a huge part of what we do that everything in my life just sort of ended up in this damn game. Uh, and he would struggle throughout all of this. And something I was really excited about was this concept of teaching in the narrative, experiencing the narrative in the play so that you were kind of training your son, uh, you were teaching him about his, uh, your life, right? You were teaching him how to be a god and he was kind of in turn teaching Kratos how to be a human being, something he had forgotten so long ago. Uh, and to some degree, we succeeded, you know? There was a lot of things that I really wanted to do. I remember I was constantly talking about the teaching and making that the focal point of many of the pitches. And everybody always said, but yeah, how are you gonna do it? And I was like, well, I don't know. We'll figure it out later, which is what we all do. We just figure it out later. And another, just stellar graphic. I mean, if anybody wants me to do any sort of side hustle artwork for them, I'm free. Uh, that's so good. So the game pillars uh, were not sort of the traditional game pillars that we were talking about. This was kind of the aspirational goals of what we were going to do with the game. Um, and starting off something that in the beginning of God of War, all the way back in 2003 when I was there, um, we had always talked about this concept of the pick up and play game a fun and accessible game. And it seems obvious that you say, we're gonna make a, a game that's fun and accessible. Uh, because, you know, who wants to make a game that's completely obtuse, 
Um, but I, I realized that we needed to say that. There's a lot of things that we needed to just sort of reinforce and tell each other constantly to sort of change the way we were thinking. And the next thing was really important in that. I remember all the way back at the beginning, we used to use two words to describe this game in literally every single instance, brutal and epic. And I was like, we can never say those damn words ever again because what we would do is using those words would help us sort of fall back on our old habits, our old ways. So I made an attempt to try to figure out how do you replace brutal? Well, unflinching, of course. Uh, the, the idea of the sort of unflinching close and personal combat was also my early programming to seed the concept of the no-cut camera. So four weeks in, I was not bold enough to tell people that I wanted to have a single camera shot throughout the entire game because I knew it was crazy. Um, but I was starting to at least see this idea. So throughout the presentation, I was actually putting things in so eventually I could say, see, we already talked about this, so you agreed, it's fine, right? <laughs> and then this one is, again, another one of those, hey, give me some money. Uh, I'm gonna say something that literally every freaking game does. We're gonna make an interactive and immersive world. Yeah, everybody does that. Uh, but again, wave the arms, say it loud, and then people are like, all right, here you go. <laughs> The next one, this was another very, very uh, obvious, like seamless narrative, seamless play and character development. This was where I started telling people about this idea of constantly going, you know, in one sort of experience, always feeling like you can't even tell the difference between any of it. So in the early God of War games, the big thing that we had done was the no loading screens, which was a giant hassle on the first game. A lot of arguments over that one because it's so many things that you have to do, so many unseen problems and so many people have to contribute to try to make that work. And the no cut camera was the same thing. It was just me assigning a lot of work to the entire team. Uh, it was insane. And, and here's a, an awesome fail point. I couldn't not use the word epic. I couldn't find another word that actually worked really good. In fact, throughout the, the entire game, I ended up just giving up and saying, all right, fine, epic is the one I'm just going to accept because like operatic was not working and most of the other things were not working. And what I really wanted to highlight was this idea that in the previous God of War games, we had exploration. So we had like, you know, a chest on the main path that you were at. We had a hallway with a chest or a hallway that would go to a room with a chest. Uh, but I wanted to really broaden the exploration. I wasn't really admitting how big I wanted the game to be at this point because I thought it would freak people out. So I was just like, oh, you know, it's gonna be a little bit bigger. Don't worry, it's all good. We're, it's like 10 hours, 10 hours, man. We're just, I'm not crazy, all right? Uh, and something that Eric Williams and I had talked about in this early, early time uh, was this, this, on, this concept of simple and honest, right? And this idea of being honest with ourselves, being honest with the team, uh, and, and really getting back to this, this concept of the simple mechanic being fun, finding many ways that something individual can have different purposes, and getting back to the basics. Right, getting back to the basics, not only for the studio of focusing on the things that we're really good at, but really getting back to the basics of what this franchise was, tearing everything out and kind of finding the things that were sort of the load-bearing walls of everything. And the next thing was the, the play pyramid. And this, this image, I am shocked that legal let me keep this in, but I'm super excited about it because The Road was a really big influence for me. I had written a short story early on that was kind of a tone piece that helped people understand. It was kind of the foundation of what the beginning of the game was. Um, and you know, it was written in the way that was just saying the father and the son. So even in the entire short story, I never mentioned the name Kratos. And I didn't mention Atreus because I hadn't figured out the name until like 2000, the end of 2016 or something like that because I'm super lazy when it comes to coming up with names. I'm terrible at that. But the play pyramid is this concept of saying, what is making up your moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, right? Um, and in a way, it's basically saying that anytime you're playing the game, if you're not doing one of these sort of three core things, then you need to evaluate whether or not you should put a ton of effort into what it is you're currently doing. It's a way to evaluate, uh, want to add something to the game. Is it, is it contributing to these sort of core concepts? But I wanted to add another element inside of it, which was this sort of central piece, so that the game was about either narrative combat or exploration. And every one of those things fed into character development. So it didn't matter what we were doing, everything had to help further the arcs of the characters. Everything had to help get you into the minds of the characters so that you would never feel like, oh, this is the time where you're telling me the story. This is the time where I hit things. And this 
image looks really bad. And in all, all defense to the artists who helped me, I asked them 10 minutes before I had to meet with uh, Scott Rohde if he could do something. So this is better in 10 minutes than I did in probably four weeks. Uh, but I'm gonna skip ahead now to the 2014 God of War pitch for Shuhei Yoshida. Okay, so this one was a little bit more refined. I had already made the mistake of writing the wrong story and telling the writers that we had to throw that story out and that did not go well. Um, and then we started over. I kind of needed to buckle down and figure out the skeleton structure of what the entire game was so that I could then spend the next three years doing these three hour long pitches uh, of walking people through the story and then having them look at me at the end and go like, how many teams are gonna work on this game? This thing is huge. So now we have a little bit fancier PowerPoint, right? Uh, and also you can see that instead of narrative, this is father, son. And this was a reminder to myself, the person who originally came up with these rules to follow the damn rules that I had actually set out to do. And the father, son was to say, the whole game story was supposed to be about the relationship between these two characters, not necessarily about all these plotty elements that we were really excited to explore. Uh, so, all of that sort of fed into the concept of character growth. And the father-son story really is this kind of relatable human story. So much of the moments in this game are just ripped from the lives of people on the team, the writers, myself. Um, and this rule, the second one, is really something that, that I picked up while I was working with George Miller. And he knew and had sort of been reinforced by so many other people. Um, but I didn't really get it the first time he told me. He's like, you always got to dramatize your exposition. I was like, okay, cool. It just seems like that's what everybody does. And that is absolutely not what everybody does. It's insane. So he gave me this example. Um, and it is a play that he went to go see. And, and there are these two women on stage sitting on a couch. And in between them is a phone. And they start talking. And the phone begins to ring. And it rings a couple of times before one of the women goes, oh, well, aren't you going to answer that? And she says, no, 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 uh, it's, it's probably my son. I don't want to talk to him. And they continue talking for a little bit, and the phone keeps ringing. And the other woman finally says, you know what? Maybe you should answer that. What if he's sick? What if he's hurt? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, we're, we're not really good right now. She starts talking about the fact that they got into an argument, uh, and the phone keeps ringing. And this is pre-answering machines, which is why that phone is going to keep fucking ringing until somebody answers it. And as it's going, the audience you find yourself kind of creeping up on the edge of your seat a little bit and it's agitating you. You're getting agitated like the other character because you want her to answer the damn phone. And they go and go and what you, you find out is that you are getting all of the exposition about this character's relationship to her son that normally if we were lazy, like a lot of the times I am very lazy, uh, you would get from Irving the explainer, who just comes onto the scene and tells you, here's all the backstory, this is the, the, the sort of situation that I had. But in that moment, what you got was a feeling of empathy and a feeling of connection to a character because you were under stress. You were taking part in the drama and finding out about all of this sort of boring backstory information. And that stuck with me hugely, because in what we do, we can kind of translate that to play versus watch. And there was so much in the game that we wanted to create in a play experience, right? But it's really, really expensive. You have all these sort of fail states and everything that you need to do. So we did a lot, but there was still a lot more I felt like we could have done. We just kind of continued to run out of time and said, all right, we have to pull these things out. But then compensated, and then every once in a while, some other things got interactive. So now the combat aspect, really the most important part of this one, because I continue to love referencing Marvel, uh, is this idea of Marvel Comics versus Marvel Film. So Dave Jaffe, when he was pitching the original game back in 2000, well, I came in 2003, but he was doing it in 2002 uh, before that, uh, would always talk about God of War as heavy metal magazine meets Clash of the Titans, right? It's sort of this bombastic comic book, very mature, adult, fantastic sort of experience. And, you know, what we were trying to do is bring it into the modern era, right? And the games that we're playing, the games that are exciting us of today, uh, we wanted to bring this in there. And we were looking at the way that, you know, Marvel would translate comic books into film, right? My mom would not read a Thor comic, but she'd be damn sure she's gonna go see Chris Hemsworth as Thor, right? <laughs> so I was like, as long as I cast Chris, I'm good, right? My mom will play the game. Uh, but that transition 
really show that you can take something fantastic and bring it and expand the audience and get them to connect to the work that you're doing. And the con context in the, uh, the, the drama was also another important thing of saying, a lot of us make games that have combat in them. You know, it's fun. It's, it's very sort of frenetic and exciting to have combat in your game, but a lot of the times you don't have any context of this combat within the drama of your game, right? To actually feel like, oh, the combat means something in the overall goal. And coming up with that simple goal, at this time I had known that we were going to take the ashes to the top of the mountain. Everything started to feed into this goal that was simple. Everybody understood it very quickly in the game and you were able to feel like each one of these fights meant something even more. And to a certain degree we succeeded, certain degrees you know, we can continue to do better and all of that. And the exploration was a whole new thing for this game because I wanted it to be so much bigger than anything that we had done. And at the time, when I was pitching this, uh, talking about the mechanics that would encourage discovery and exploration, we didn't have those mechanics. We were still figuring a lot of that stuff out. In fact, the engine wasn't completely ready. Uh, a lot of things were like Lego pieces all over the floor, and I'm trying to, hey, we need to come up with new verbs of how to, to, to make puzzles. And, and it's like, okay, but how? We can't even build anything in the engine right now. So that was very stressful. This time, uh, especially when we were doing exploration, was one of the more stressful things. In fact, honestly, the whole damn project was stressful, but, but there was a tremendous amount for me of this doubt in wondering, you know, are we gonna be able to finish any of this stuff because there is just so much to get done. And the character growth, everything feeding into that one, I had really started to, to cement what this meant, continue to say teach, Right? Even though I had no idea how teaching was going to take place in the game, I had that fallback of like, okay, well, upgrading is kind of like teaching your kid gets better throughout the game. But thankfully, working with a the team, they end up kind of contributing so many different ideas that make that initial kernel of something a lot better. But it was important to actually see these characters change, not just in their dramatic arc, but in their sort of visual as well as their play, so that it actually feels like what you're doing is growing with these characters, experiencing their lives. So the, the pitching of all of this stuff, I would be pitching all the way through the end of the project. It would just continue ad nauseum. That's really all you do. It's like selling cars to the team every day, over and over. And nobody buys a damn car. That's what's fucked up about it. <laughs> but the doubt also continues throughout all of this experience. And I know that everybody in here who makes games we all experience failure every day. We all experience doubt every four minutes. It's science, man, I totally looked that up. It's every four minutes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna tell a story now because I fucking hate PowerPoint presentations. And I'm gonna talk about the E3 2016 demo. So this story encapsulates so many versions of doubt, so many areas of, of failure that we experienced on this project. Uh, and, and is kind of, for me, one of the most interesting clips of game development. So initially, we knew that we were gonna do uh, a reveal. We had honed in on E3 2016 as being the time we were gonna do that reveal. But I had no clue what it was gonna be. Was it just gonna be a logo? Were we just gonna show uh, a, a quick clip? of the game, uh, we we're gonna try to show a, a cut video together, right? I was gonna try to sell people on a, a no-cut camera and cut a bunch of shots together, that wasn't gonna work. Uh, or were we gonna actually try to do a demo, which was insane, right? Like the first time you're gonna reveal your game and you really don't have all the pieces together and what are you gonna do? You're gonna actually play a demo live on stage? I totally chose that one because, <laughs> because the, the, the thing was far away. It was like nine or 10 months away. So I was like, yeah, let's do the hardest thing. And I, I, I feel like I do that all the time, which is I agree to do something really hard and then right when it comes time to do it, it all, all my chickens come home to roost. I'm like, what the hell, man? Why did I agree to this? So I started writing up different demo ideas, just really jotting stuff down quickly. Uh, and at the time we had not figured out the beginning of the game. I had written the short story back then, but we had not settled on, hey, that's gonna be the beginning of the game. We were focusing a lot on the middle section of the game, so some stuff in the mountain. Uh, if you've all played the game, you'll understand this part inside the mountain. Uh, and so I said, oh, you know what, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna write a demo up, it'll be inside the mountain. Um, it'll end at the elevator, kind of going up, and there'll be a big scary monster reveal at the end that screams, and then you go to black all fucking dramatically. Uh, it's so cheesy. Um, but I thought it was really great. There was a part of me 
that was saying, mm, this isn't so good. So I was sending it to people on the team, and I think they were just being nice, and they were like, oh, yeah, sure, that's cool, right? You didn't, oh, oh, sure, that's cool is not the response you want when you send somebody a demo writer. You want them to be like, yeah. So I got some notes from people um, and sort of settled on it. We were like, all right, this is, this is good. But I, there's always something inside of me that was saying, I don't think this is very good. But to be honest, there is always something inside of me that is saying, this is no good and you suck. Uh, so I was like, all right, whatever, I'm going to ignore that. And we were going to have the, the events people, the PR people, and the marketing people all coming down to the studio, and I was going to do the pitch for them. And it's kind of the same thing as this, where you just get up and you wave your arms around a lot because you're asking for money. Uh, and you draw on the board, and, and, and it looks really great in photos, right? Um, so I, I get in, I start doing the pitch, and I realize like five minutes in that everybody's starting to fidget in their seats. Some people are checking their phone. I'm really losing them. And I start to speak louder because that totally makes the audience come back. <laughs> uh, and that did not work. And about halfway through the pitch, I realized, this is absolute crap. And you were right to think it was crap because it's crap. But I'm still giving the pitch. So in my mind, I'm starting to think like of, of ways to eject. Like, OK, what, what, what can I do here? I need to come up with a better solution. This is not working. And I start having a few ideas of potentially the beginning of the game, a few visual ideas that are coming up while I'm just running on autopilot on the pitch, because I figure, why try? It sucks. You know, they're, they're not having fun. Uh, and I get all the way to the end of the pitch, and they, you know, everybody's, oh, yeah, cool, all right. Yeah. Nobody outright says it sucks. Uh, that's usually only on the development side. We're very honest with each other, but people in the PR and marketing groups, they're all very nice. They're very good people. Uh, uh, and they will just say it sucks when they leave the room or when you leave the room. Uh, so I was like, all right, thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, we, I left the room. And I, I think somebody had talked to Shannon immediately afterwards and said, yikes, that was bad. You know, like it's, you know, it's not terrible. It's just not that exciting. We've sort of seen it before. And they're right. Everybody does that exact same demo for E3. So I was like, all right, I was not feeling good. I went to Shannon and I said, I want to take another crack at this because I don't think we've nailed it. I don't think we have the, the idea down. And she was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and I was like, uh, feelings, come on. Uh, no, she was really cool about it. She's like, all right, Barlog, because uh, she never calls me by a first name. She said, but all right, Barlog, go ahead, uh, figure something out. So I wrote up a, a, a quick sort of skeleton of what it would be, what ended up being the demo that, that we were doing. And we got on a, a conference call with uh, the, the events and PR people because they were like, dude, the first one sucked. I'm not coming down for that. Like, Just do it over the phone, which really sucks. Pitching people in person, you get the big arms thing. That's, that carries like 50% of the work most of the time. And then you could draw on the board, which is like another 25%. So I really don't have to do a lot of work verbally. And then when you're on the little speakerphone thing, it's pretty much just all you, what you're saying. Uh, and, and surprisingly, the really rough pitch worked. And they were like, OK, this is really good. You know, Thank you for taking our notes to heart. And I was like, I'm not going to tell you that it wasn't your notes. But yes, thank you for giving me notes. And I took them all to heart. And I redid everything based on what you were saying to me. Uh, so they were like, all right, well, we're going to come down in another two weeks. And we'll talk a little bit further about what we're going to do. So they come down, I give them the full pitch with the big arms thing, you know, and that goes over really well because everybody loves in-person pitches. And at the end, I couldn't resist. I threw in a little joke uh, and I said, you know, and then we can get Bear and, and he can play live orchestra the whole thing. And I was like, ha ha. And then one of the guys who is in charge of throwing these events, he's like the, the guy who does all the stage stuff and everything, his eyes just get really big. <laughs> Like super excited, and I was like, wait, what, what happened? And then he looks over at somebody, and you could tell there was a conversation that had happened about this before I threw that joke down. And I was like, oh, interesting, all right. And then they, they basically did not talk about it any further than that, and then said, what we're going to do, we're going to do the stage show, blah, 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 blah. And they said, we'll be down in another couple of weeks. We'll show you a little bit more. So then another couple of weeks go by. I almost forget about this, because we're starting to really figure out how to structure this entire demo, how to build it. And when they come down, 
the, the guy whose eyes got really big had this little diorama. He had created this like little mock-up of a, a, a theater stage, right? And it had these little slots where he could put transparencies in to show you like what the things like the curtains or the, the stage things that they would put in. And he was so excited. He was like, a, it's like when I get excited about something, he's just pitching this. He says, we're really excited about doing the live performance to the live orchestra. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> And he was like, this is really good. And, and you know, we were talking about this, so we're really going to make it happen. We already talked to Bear. And I'm like, you know, inside going, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> but outside, I'm going like, cool. <laughs> Let's do this, right? Uh, so they give the whole breakdown of all this stuff. And, and again, it's still pretty far away. So I'm all right. I'm like, eh, all right, fine. We'll figure this out. But at the time, we're going through really stressful times. Because one, engine's still getting built. Two, the lighting was maybe 35 to 40% of what it was going to end up being in the final game. And that was actually what we were going to end up using for E3. So we were, there was just no way we were going to get that done. Art direction, we hadn't really been able to figure out exactly what our art direction was going to be. We were arguing back and forth a lot. We had some ideas. I had some specific things. The art director at the time had some specific things. And we were just tr really trying to hash that out. At the same time, trying to figure out the combat trying to figure out the enemies. We were literally, every aspect of the game that you could try to figure out, we were trying to figure out. So we were trying to take an inaugural flight in a plane while we were building the plane and also drawing the blueprints of the plane <laughs> as it was taking off. It was fantastic and incredibly, incredibly stressful. So as we're going closer, it starts to hit that I'm going to have to play this thing live, right? And it's going to be nine minutes. So I start rehearsing. And I'm going to rehearse for like two months, right? And I think, and there's a bunch of members of the team here, so they'll probably agree with this, I hope. Um, this is probably the greatest time for the team because I was basically playing for the team while they all shouted notes at me and then like wrote long emails of like, you need to do this, you're doing this wrong, you did this, you suck, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it was, it was fantastic because I, I, I had to perfectly hit all of these moves in an order while we were also trying to figure out which moves were going to be the best moves to put in order while we were also designing them and animating them and make them work. And Bless them, they figured out several tricks to sort of put the bumpers in the bowling lane, the director version of it, so I couldn't screw it up too bad. So they had removed some of the potential catastrophic failures that an idiot like me could do uh, if I hit the wrong button. But still, I had to time everything, I had to use the sticks, I had to actually do all the combos and everything like that, I had to position myself correctly. So I still had an opportunity to mess it up. I had many, many, many opportunities that I could mess it up. And in a lot of my playthroughs, I would mess it up, which was, you know, the, the face palm for everybody on the team. Every time I'd be like, I think I got it this time. And I'd play for everybody. And they'd be like, mm, no, you're, you're rushing this part. You're not doing that part. I was like, ah. Oh. It was like the entire team was the director at that point. And I was just like, take a note. OK, yeah, that's good. All right, all right, good. Uh, very, very stressful. But it was so much work that I was like, all ah, right, you know, I think I could handle this. No big deal. Uh, and as we're getting closer, now, in previous God of War games, the thing I was remembering so much about E3 was like on God of War 2, we were burning demo discs at like 6 a.m. the day of the show to drive them down and put them in the machine so people could play them on the floor. So we really like went right up against the edge. But in this E3, we had to be done two weeks before. So two weeks before E3, we had to be finished, which felt weird, I think, to most of us going like, man, E3's not for two weeks. It feels weird. We're done. What do we do with ourselves? Make the rest of the fucking game, right? <laughs> but I was also then just rehearsing over and over and over again and stressing uh, about, OK, uh, I have to hit this. And then we had a couple of rehearsals with the orchestra. Uh, but it was all leading up to the day of the show, right? And, and throughout all this time, I am constantly just in my head having this voice of like, you're going to screw it up, and, and having all these potential mess ups that I could, that could do. And on the day of the show, there was going to be a dress rehearsal. And then immediately after the dress rehearsal, you had a little bit of a break, and then the actual show would start. So you'd kind of do it twice. Uh, and I went down, and you know, I'd like to go in that we, we had not told anybody about the game. So it was a complete surprise that God of War was going to be at this show. On the, at one of the PSXs, I might have said, yeah, we're working on a God of War game. But you know, nobody paid attention to that. Um, and I basically had to like put a hood on and nobody like like anybody would fucking recognize me anyway. Like at the time, like I don't think anybody had any idea who the hell I was, but it was all for me. I was just like, yeah, I'm so I gotta go stealth in the back entrance. Uh, and so I get in and I am just like, I hadn't slept the night before. 
Uh, I maybe slept 20 minutes. I was so freaking nervous uh, and, and just constantly going over the, the demo in my head. And you know, on the drive down there, there was a, a cameraman in the car interviewing me. And I was already nervous, but every damn question he asked me made me more nervous because it was really like, so you're afraid you're going to screw up? How specifically do you think you'll screw up? <laughs> and when you do that screw up, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think people are going to say on Reddit, right? And I was like, you know, I hadn't gotten that specific in my neurosis to say, like, what is Reddit going to say? But I'm there now, dude. Thanks. <laughs> so I get in there, and we, we do our, our dry run. And this is the first time we did the fail run, right? And that is that you have a kit, a backup kit, and then the sort of ultimate fail, the catastrophic sort of fail, is you have to stand up, and they turn on your mic, and then you sort of apologize to the audience that you suck and that we are going to just roll a video. And that hadn't been real for me until that moment. I talked about it, but when we rehearsed it and I had to like stand up in that empty theater and say, uh, sorry, it didn't work, I was like, man, I do not want to do this again. This is a one and done thing. Uh, because that's scary. Like, like not only is it uh, screwing up the demo is scary, but the fact that it doesn't crash, you know, is something that you're hoping and hoping and hoping. And if it crashes, that's just, I, it's normal. That's game development, right? It's, it's no big deal, but it's still, Crashing in front of a whole audience of people sucks, right? And I did not want to do that. And it's a testament to our incredible team that our game was pretty darn stable at that point. So thank you to them. Um, so I did the thing, and then Kevin Scharf, who was the producer at the time, and I went back into the green room. Now, the green room was basically just like curtains, like a box of curtains backstage. Had a couple tables and a little bar in there with some water. No booze. Searched everywhere, no booze. Uh, which I think was a good thing. I probably really would have screwed up if there was booze there. Um, so we're sitting there for, for, I guess we had 45 minutes before the show was going to start, the actual show. And we're just kind of hanging out, and I'm going through everything in my head, and he's trying to keep me calm, but anybody who tries to keep me calm is just making me less calm, and I'm stressing more and worrying about all the things that could potentially go wrong. When the curtains pop open, and a Japanese man pokes his head in and looks around. And then he just quickly closes it. And I'm like, weird. <laughs> I was like, that was weird, right, Kevin? And he was like, yeah, that's strange. And, and I was like, whatever. It's Los Angeles, so whatever, that's normal. Uh, <laughs> so we're sitting there for another couple of minutes. And then all of a sudden, in extremely dramatic fashion, the curtains burst open. And this group of people files in. And at the back of that group of people is Hideo Kojima. Right? Bathed in light. <laughs> Fucking magneto tiles below his feet. <laughs> right? And I was just like, oh, wow, wow. And then I suddenly became like five-year-old me. I was like, oh, this is great. And he does the, the Hideo Kojima like head nod. And then I do the whole like, so. <laughs> then they just walk in, sit down at the other table, and start talking amongst themselves. And I was spending like the next five minutes trying to think of an opening line, right? Like to, to go over there and be like, so you come to E3 often? Uh, <laughs> I came up with nothing, uh, but it distracted me away from being stressed out. And then I realized I'm not going to go over and talk to this guy. Uh, so I'm just going to go back into my own little world. And uh, about five minutes after that, one of the guys stands up, walks over to our table, and says, hello, we are going to eat Panda Express. It is going to stink. <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> then he bowed and walked back to the fucking table. <laughs> then I really thought it was weird. <laughs> and I actually, at that moment, contemplated whether I was having some fucked up fever dream <laughs> and that I had not yet gotten up. Unfortunately, they had called, I, I actually, interestingly, I actually asked Kojima if I could tell this story because I thought, oh, I, I should get permission before I can say this publicly. Uh, and I contacted somebody uh, that, that I know that works with him and asked him about it and he said, yeah, okay, hold on. Then he got back and he said, yeah, Kojima doesn't even remember that. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's sweet. Fantastic. I make a hell of an impression, right? Uh, so 
I, I, they, they basically, curtains open again, time to go, right? Then it's the heart beating like absolute mad. I'm like, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. So Kevin and I get up and they're escorting us back uh, to the thing, he powers on my, my lav mic, which just reminds me that, oh, potentially we could have a catastrophic failure, that sucks. Uh, and we're going up the stairs, and as we're going up the stairs to the balcony, everything's gonna start, right, very soon. People are already in the theater, the orchestra's all there. I realized that I forgot everything about the whole demo. Like, and that was a horror story of mine going like, oh man, it's like going and, and taking a test and you forget everything. But I, I didn't think that would actually happen, and it legitimately happened. I was so amped up about this, I was so scared about all this, that I legitimately forgot what I was supposed to do. I couldn't remember the first button, I couldn't remember the cue that I was supposed to come in on, and I was like, oh crap, and we're sitting down, and Kevin's sitting next to me, and I'm like, do I tell Kevin that I don't remember any of it? Because maybe he'll remember the first thing, and that'll get me started, but if I tell him, that makes it real. So if I just keep it inside, then maybe everything will be fine, right? So I'm just stressing the whole time, like, oh my god, oh my god, what's the first thing, what's the first thing? And I literally can think of almost every game that I'd ever played, except what I was supposed to be playing at the time. <laughs> and at a certain point in the overture, I had been able to see the, the kind of tablature screen that was, was playing for Bear as he was composing, or as he was conducting, uh, and I was like, oh, it just came back to me, like an image on the, the screen made me realize like, oh, I gotta hit start at that point when it says 110, okay, yeah, I got it. And then it kind of just started to slowly fall into place. And it turned out, I think several people on the team had said that, you know, I did pretty good, I didn't screw it up, I think was uh, the best I can get, you know, that it actually worked out really well. And in the end, it actually did work out really well. People responded very positively. That uh, reveal of Kratos, we, we were really excited about Kratos coming out of the shadows, but I don't think any of us had any clue the kind of response we were gonna get for that, so that was super overwhelming and awesome, right? And I think the important thing about all of that, about the entire thing, besides the fact that I hung out with Kojima while he ate Panda Express, <laughs> and he was not kidding, it fucking smelled like orange chicken back there for like an hour, it was crazy, uh, was that throughout all of it, all of us, and me especially, was ex I was experiencing doubt at every single step of the way, right? It was this sort of imposter syndrome times a thousand, this feeling of what I have to say isn't valid, what I'm doing isn't all that good, uh, and pushing through that, breaking through each one of those walls kind of led to, well, sadly, another wall of doubt that would be there. But that was sort of the process. That was the process of pushing through all of that and ensuring that we could get to that end result. And there was times even right before, in that two week span before E3, where we're kind of refining last bits of, of things in the, the, the play experience, where there was even members of the team, very good people, you know, not malicious whatsoever. They weren't being mean about it, but they were nervous. They were telling me, oh my God, I think you're gonna screw up the franchise. Like, this is, this is a terrible way to present it. One person told me, why don't we have a boss fight at the end? We should have a big boss fight. Uh, I think another person even suggested, we should have Balder on a dragon kind of come up when they're at the deer and be like, I've been looking for you. <laughs> All these crazy like, like last minute suggestions that I was like, oh my God, no. And, and I was basically just saying, don't worry, everything will be fine. Even though inside I'm going, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck. And it's something to remember, I think, for all of us in what we do. At any time, the next time probably, which is you know five minutes from now, uh, you're gonna be hearing that voice in your head or the voices directly around you, the people that you work with that say that you're wrong, you, you have nothing good to say, you're going in the wrong direction, why are we doing this? Uh, you suck, you're a jerk. Well, the last two are just me talking to myself. Uh, remember that those voices are wrong. And sometimes they're right. Because if you remember all the way back at the beginning, I was actually right to doubt that crappy demo because it was crap, right? And that's the messed up part about doubt in general, is that it's right as much as it's wrong. And it is up to all of us individually, for each individual situation, to be honest with ourselves, to trust ourselves, to trust the people around us, because they're the ones who really do all the great stuff anyway. I just sort of bask in the limelight of their awesomeness. Uh, and 
really endeavor to push through every one of those fucking doubt walls because on the other side is always something better than where you were at from the beginning. So there you go. That is my little chat at GDC. Thank you, everybody. How much time do we have? Ah, perfect. Oh, wait. Thank you. See, I got a slide for thanking you. Uh, OK, so we have 10 minutes, and we can do questions. So feel free to ask any questions except the following two questions. What are you working on right now, or is there going to be another God of War? I can't answer that. <laughs> two, don't ask who blew the fucking horn. Because we're not going to tell you. That's like the polar bear and lost, man. I'm not going to say anything about that. All right, great. Fire away, my friend. Hi. So Hi. You talked about a situation with the E3 demo, which was great, where you listened to some intuition that you had to change it preemptively. I was wondering if you could also give an example of a time when um, other people's feedback, other people's notes were actually really informative in you changing your mind in the process. Oh, that's a lot of examples. Uh, <laughs> my mind was changed many times. OK, there's, there's a really good point in the game where uh, the, the sun becomes a jerk. Right, And uh, we had a whole slew of gameplay that we needed to build around that. So there was about an hour of gameplay where he was a jerk. And we had to cut it. So there was a point where production-wise, time-wise, I had no more big arms were going to give me more money uh, that I just had to, I had to get rid of it. But that meant that a huge chunk of the story was getting cut out, and we needed to figure out how to put it back in place. And I was like, okay, you know what? We're just going to do something really quick. We'll do this small piece. We'll do a small cinematic. Because I had been selling people for so long and begging people for so long to put more effort in, do this, can add this extra thing, that I figured this was the, the thing that's going to break them if I asked them to go too far. And the animators, the cinematic group, were actually the ones that went far beyond the initial ask. So I thought, oh, we'll be fine if we just do this one little thing. They're like, no, 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 I think we could do something even better. And they worked with Eric Williams. They actually came up with the moment that something that we talked about way early on in the game, which was I wanted to see Atreus try to be rage mode, right? But we ended up not getting it. Had, had I not cut that stuff, we would not have had the animators be superheroes and actually make that cinematic when Modi returns and then Atreus gets all raged out, right? They brought all that back. And it was sort of their contribution, their pushing that, that added something, I think, that was so critical to the arc that I was not even able to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, yes. Hi, Corey. Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you. So, question. I'm an audio guy a little bit. Hello, what's, audio guy. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> I can't hear you. Uh, oh, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my biggest fear. Yeah. So um, as a big fan of the series, uh, one of the biggest things, the shockers for me, was when you went from the voice actor of T.C. Carson to Christopher Judge. Yes. I, I mean, I hated it for like the first like three hours of gameplay, honestly. And then three I, hours? It took you three hours to not hate it. All right. I, I'm serious. I'll work, I, I'll I, I work harder next time. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like T.C. Carson was Kratos. He is amazing. Yeah. So, like, how did you, like, but then I ended up really loving Christopher Judge. I'm like, wow, this guy's, he made the new Kratos. What made you, like, decide to make the switch? It was a complex series of decisions. So, in the early portion of the game, uh, we had used TC in Ascension, a game that I did not work on, uh, but I had heard some of the stories uh, of how it worked. And TC was actually in the suit, right? So that they were shooting a lot of these scenes on there. TC is a smaller guy, that he is a classically trained dancer. And when he moves, it is almost impossible for him to not move fucking gracefully. Awesome. He just floats. He's, he's magical, right? And it created a lot of work for the animators afterwards to have to kind of reanimate to make him feel like Kratos, this big, imposing guy, right? TC was absolutely sort of a product of the PS2 era where you could, you could do all the animation and then you could record the voice afterwards. But to get the scenes that I wanted, I knew I had to have all the actors on stage because we were doing that one single camera shot. We experimented a little bit early on where we got a stand-in person that was large, and they would be Kratos, they would perform on the stage, and then we would go after the fact and record TC. So we started to run the numbers on that one, we started to run the time, and apparently like 2036 was when we'd finished the game, 
uh, if we did it in this oh, method. Wow. It was insane how much work it would end up being. So it was very, for me, a difficult decision uh, because he's such an intrinsic part of the franchise. But I knew like, okay, if we're gonna do this, we're just gonna have to do this. I'm gonna have to commit to recasting. And it turned out to be one of the hardest things, right? Two people that were hard to cast, Balder and Kratos. Both of those characters took almost, you know, three, three and a half years. I found a kid like in the first set of auditions. It was ridiculous. <laughs> Um, so I thought everything would be that easy. It was not. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Excellent talk. Excellent game. Uh, oh, congratulations you, on all the awards. You are awesome. And I think we all here agree. Uh, no, oh, my head is just getting huge now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you originally pitched the game in June 2013, right? I Which uh, a game that some of us may know came out around that time, The Last of Us. Uh, I haven't heard of that. What's it about? Yeah, it's, it's very cool. Very cool. Uh, there are some, I mean, obviously there's like a lot of similarities between the two, even though both games stand on their own and they're very unique. Were you worried at any point that people would draw the comparison and whether there could be negatives to that or, or not? I think a little bit. You know, there was a little part of me that said, when I played that game, it was this sort of awakening moment, I think, for this industry. Now, prior to this game, a lot of great games have been doing very dark and, and very intense subject matter. So it's not as if they were the first ones to do it, and I, I don't think they claim it either, uh, but they were the first ones to have a broad audience for this, to show me, to show everybody else in the industry that people wanted this kind of content, that people actually were interested in something that challenged them emotionally. And I thought, okay, this is the opportunity. This is the opportunity now that people are actually claiming for content like this. I did fear a little bit that people were going to make the comparisons and boy, howdy was I right. The first like year <laughs> after the announce was basically just like the last of us of war and every other variation on that one, right? I, although I really did like all the, the gifs that were created after we released, uh, sort of making fun of all of that. Um, but I think as we were developing, we all realized that we were going in a very different direction. The two games are, are so, so very different. Yeah. But the fact that we were in close, we were personal, and we were trying to tell this story about two characters struggling to have a relationship, uh, you're never going to be able to escape that, right? That is the, the same way that you know many movies that have very high-level concepts that are similar are always going to have the same comparisons. But I think each thing sort of always stands on its own. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, there, are, there are people on both. Hello. Oh my gosh, Hi. sorry. Uh, what's your favorite thing that you had to cuss or that got cuss? What, my favorite thing to what? The, the, what's your favorite like feature or thing that you had to cuss in order to Oh, my favorite thing that I had to cut. Does everybody remember the eagle in the background of Helheim? Yeah, yeah, that one. There was, that one was in all the way from the beginning. When I had to write the story, the skeleton of the story, I just added some eagle into the story because I couldn't figure out how to end it and I had to pitch the whole story to the team. So I just threw something in there. And I wanted to figure out a way to how to keep this eagle in. And the art director actually had fallen in love with uh, the eagle as well. So he was pushing to put it in uh, and animate it, even when we had to cut it as a boss. So we had to cut it as a boss. We ran out like the so many bosses that we were planning that we just had to cut because it takes so many people, so much money, so much time to do one of these bosses because we are crazy people, perfectionists, and we want to make them awesome and big. Um, and there was actually a moment where the eagle sort of randomly appeared in one of the levels, like skunk work style. So I was like, oh man, it's making a comeback. Uh, and I think one of the producers had referred to it as, oh man, that eagle is like a giant fuck you to production, right? <laughs> and I love everybody in production, but I also really love that phrase. That was hilarious. Thank you. Wait, over here. No more? Let's do one more, because I totally messed these guys up. I, I skipped them, so there you go. Uh, hi, I was hey. wondering about the E3 demo. You were talking about how they uh, tried to add bumpers to make sure you try yeah. to mitigate the chances of uh, failure. What were some of those bumpers that were added? Uh, they had situations where um, I wouldn't be able to do certain wrong moves in, in certain areas so that if I enter a, a, a zone or an area, they would make sure that the, the combo would click the way that I needed to click it, but I still had to position properly and time each one of those, but I couldn't accidentally suddenly pull out like a special move or anything like that. Um, they had put some sort of invisible collision bumpers that kind of helped me 
cutting corners or times when I had to walk and rotate the camera. So there was a lot of times where I was walking around and I, I'd have to do these like really smooth camera sweeps to kind of give people the feeling of, ah, oh, so majestic. Uh, <laughs> so we found all these ways to kind of make it just a little bit easier without automating anything because we still wanted that feeling of, oh yeah, it's actually me on the sticks doing this. All right. I, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's saying, the red shirts are saying we're done.